A coming weather change prompted us to leave this magnificent anchorage and sail around the Tasman Peninsula to visit historic Port Arthur. An unexpected hazard of Canoe Bay is this thick duckweed which can present a challenge if you need to recover your anchor in a hurry, especially if, like most people, you don't sail with a Malay parang. Oh yeah. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> Good luck with yours. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. Join us as we sail around Australia, visiting its wild places in our 30 foot, 50 year old sailing boat, Marul. Living off the land and sea while sailing a yacht that costs less than a new car, we show that it's possible to have big adventures with a seaworthy boat on a very modest budget. Goodbye to Port Sydney Bay and we're heading around to Port Arthur. We're just sailing past Cape Pui now where we walked the other day. Pretty specky but very grey skies. Typical Tassie day. Typical Tassie summer day. <laughs> As we come out of the bay here, we're just on a, a close reach. We're not close hauled, we're just off, so that's Marul's favourite point of sail. So it's fairly moderate winds. It's not light, it's not heavy, it's just right. So I've got the traveller down most of the way. I haven't gone all the way, just so I can just give myself a bit more room on the winch here. And I've got the main sheet sheeted on pretty hard. So what I want to try and do is flatten out my sail as much as possible in these medium winds. And the same with the head sail. I've moved the car along the side just a little bit forward so I can get a good pull on it. So my sails are pretty much as straight as possible. Try to eliminate as much twist as I can. Get as much power as we can out of these moderate conditions. If it lightened up a bit more, I'd probably pull the traveler a little bit more and just put a bit more twist and that would help to accelerate wind on my mainsail. Um, and again, I'd do the same with the head sail. And paradoxically, if it really, really strengthened up, I'd do the same thing, I'd put twist in because we've only got two reefs. So a way of depowering the mainsail is to actually move my traveller over, put some twist in the, in, the, uh, in the main and let the wind exhaust out of the top. In a perfect world we'd have three reefs and we probably will at some stage, but we'll see how we go. It's really nice having telltales over the main and over the head sail because I can look at all of them and make sure on both sails that they're both streaming backwards. It's really just a, it's so helpful. A lot of main sails only have the telltales on the on the on the trailing edge, okay, on the leech. But ours have got it all through there, and we can really fine tune how our sail goes. Move the traveller, move the main sheet. Whoa. I might uh, move my backside because it's about to get wet. Oh, look at that. It's a little tuna. Oh, wow. it's, the, it's exactly the size we wanted. We were 
little worried about getting some of the big tuna that are down here. So I guess coming in closer to the cliffs, it was nice to get that little package. And that's about right. Just the width of the cockpit is about right for two of us. So that's the end of our day's fishing. <laughs> This little recess is really handy for this sort of thing. Oh, you mean between the cockpit sole and the... Between, between this soft patch to get in to access the gearbox and the drivetrain. Yeah, and this, this white stuff here, like when we, when we were catching, when we were catching our little mackerel and everything, you know, they could be put in there and it drains really easily down the drains, keeps everything clean, keeps this guy out. Look, he can't roll forward. It's quite nice. So I'm scrubbing that fish and just about every fish that we catch we do scrub it down. Most of the time it actually takes the scales. If the scales are quite small, um, you know, the scrubbing brush actually tends to scale them. But it takes the slime off and we ran into a guy up north, he's, he's actually got a sailing channel called Sail to Spear. And he's a pretty keen spearer and he, um, he sort of suggested to me that fillets and fish flesh um, it can possibly be contaminated by bacteria on the fish slime. And I really like this way of thinking, so we always just sort of try and get the slime off. And, you know, I think there might be something in it. Like, our, our, um, if we didn't eat our fish as quickly as we do, we might see how, how long it lasts. But we're always really happy with the taste and the quality of, of the fish that we, um, we process. So. It's certainly, it's certainly you've got nothing to lose, you know, by making things extra clean. We're going to try and shoot through the hole in the wall straight ahead. Except in the worst of conditions, it is possible to pass through the hole in the wall which is the local name for the spectacular passage between Cape Pillar and Tasman Island on the southeastern tip of Tasmania. So we're sailing into Port Arthur right now and uh, you've got to have a look at Troy. He's pretty happy. That was pretty, pretty spectacular coming through the hole in the wall. Coming through the hole in the wall? Yeah. And afterwards. I was amazed by how casual the seals are just sleeping in there with these big bomb and breakers all around. <laughs> I guess that's their job. 
There's a bumblebee. They like blue. Bit of a washing machine out here, isn't it? Bouncing off those poops. Pretty spectacular backdrop behind your head. Looks like it's been painted on the world. <laughs> you get the camera back and we'll go chill there again. Arthur Penal Station was established in 1830 as a timber camp using convict labour to produce logs for building government projects around Tasmania. By 1833 it had become a punishment station for repeat offenders from all Australian colonies. In 1840 more than 2,000 convicts, soldiers and civil staff, which included women and children, lived in Port Arthur. The station had become a major industrial settlement producing a range of goods and materials including work stone, bricks, furniture, clothing items, and ships. This is the main penitentiary building, which was originally constructed as a flour mill and granary in 1845. Grain was either ground by a water-powered mill, or when water flow was inadequate, by convicts walking a treadmill. Despite being one of the largest buildings in the colony, the venture ended due to insufficient water flow, and the mill was converted into accommodation for convicts, housing them between 1857 in 1877 when the settlement closed. Ten years after the settlement's closure, the building was devastated by fire, leaving only the masonry walls and barred windows behind. The lower floors of the building housed 136 separate cells. The maximum security prisoners were housed on the bottom floors in heavy irons. There was also a mess hall, library and church within the building. Severe weather over the last 100 years had put considerable pressure on the stability of the remains of the building. A large-scale conservation effort was undertaken between 2012 and 2018 to preserve the structural integrity of the remains. The most visible evidence of this is the heavily engineered metal supports. We're here at the Penitentiary Church in Port Arthur and it's quite a beautiful stone building. Let's take a look. Church attendance every Sunday was compulsory for prisoners and religion was thought to play an important role as part of convict reform in Port Arthur. Many of the stones used to build the church were crafted by inmates from the nearby boys prison. The church was never consecrated, which allowed for multi-denominational services to be held. Next to the church are the remains of the cottages that housed government officials on visit to the penal settlement. Thank you. 
always supposed to be quite quiet. We're in the separate prison. And the prisoners weren't like, able to speak at all while they were here. And they were masked like this. The only time inmates of the separate prison got to use their voice was singing at the weekly chapel service. Elaborate measures were taken to prevent them from seeing each other and communicating. Once standing in these wooden pens, only the chaplain and the guards would have been visible. Some men still use this opportunity to deceive the prison guards, communicating with their neighbours by exchanging words at the end of each hymn phrase. So this prison was pretty grim, like silence, everything else like that. So what do you do to those people if they break the rules? <laughs> you send them to the punishment cell. So you come through, there's four thick doors yep. just to absolutely guarantee that there's no light and they're locked in that final cell. For, total what darkness. Was it, up to 30 days, days or something? Yeah, 24 hours total darkness, which is bread and water. Total darkness, total silence. So when you get your bread and water, that's the whole reason for these four doors. So you don't even see that light yep. when you get your bread and water. Oh. We're, we're in the old hospital and so this metal, you know, obviously it wasn't original, um, but after bushfires and just natural forces came through here, there's, there's a lot of remedial work that's been taken place to preserve the site. And it's nice, you know, they've put, this, they've put the ironwork in there to support the structure, but they've, they've got those old iron beds to sort of give you a feel, you know, like of how the beds are set up on multiple floors. But the stonework here is just amazing. It is solid. It's incredible. I mean, this place is built to last. And even without care, it's still there. Now, obviously, they've got to step in and try and hold together this site because of its uh, historical value. The old stairs are quite worn away. <laughs> Soldiers were responsible for security and pursuing any escaped convicts. The guard tower and military quarters were set above the penitentiary to keep a watchful eye over the convicts and to hold the high ground in the event of a prisoner revolt. So this is quite cool. If you've never seen one of these before, it's a semaphore. And what you do is you put a bunch of these on high hills where they're visible to each other and they can be quite a distance away as long as they've got a straight line of sight and you can get a telescope there and you've got all these arms that can be operated by rope you can haul them up and leave them at a specific height and on all of those arms you can have all different types of flags and the reason being is that by doing that you can have a whole arrangement of flags and the guy that's over there in the line of sight can see that and he can interpret it and see what message you're trying to send to him he can do the same on his semaphore and send it onwards to the next guy that's in his line of sight. So with a system of these in place here, they were able to get a message before radio communications or anything like that, they were able to get a message from here to Hobart within 15 minutes. 
Oh. Did you get it? That one's ready for you. <laughs> Probably need just a couple more weeks, but they're still yummy. <gasps> The bright flash of colour accompanying the birds at the settlement really lifted our hearts, but we can only guess at the mix of emotions they would have caused in the convicts surrounded by such drab brutality. Thanks for joining us this week while we caught our first Tasmanian tuna, saw some incredible cliffs and got a little bit of a history lesson at Port Arthur. If you like the video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel as it really helps get our channel out to more viewers. We look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now.